Welcome to Change is Possible podcast, where we dive deep into incredible stories of life and career transformation. You worked in LinkedIn for eight years. Why did you decide to do it? Meet Franco, ex-head of Asia for LinkedIn Talented Learning Solutions, who is now on a life mission to help people transform their work into play. Frank is a seasoned business leader and is tackling two of the biggest problems we have nowadays. Many people feel stuck at work, but in the same time, companies and organizations need to continuously be more efficient and deliver better results. And there is a little time or resources dedicated to employees' engagement and development. And Frank's next play framework addresses just that. How do we identify ourselves? I established my self-worth based on some of those things that I was engaging in, which I was passionate about in supporting. I have actively pursued identity outside of title, outside of the company. I tried to actually identify myself as a coach to someone, maybe a, a, a dad to my son. At the end of the day, we realized that we are actually doing, really fulfilling our passion and vision of ourselves as well as to make some impact on society. Many people, you know, at a certain point of their career, get a bit of association between what are they are doing now and what they want to do. The title we have is like a crowd given by the company. When we leave the company, the crowd will be taken away from us and we'll be totally exposed. Do not hold on to the title that you're given. If I want to leave my job and start my own venture, what are the steps? So first of all, please hit subscribe to the show and leave a review or comment about how you find this episode. Hi, Frank. I'm so happy to have you on my podcast. How are you? I'm great, Annie. Thanks for inviting me. And it's so good to see you again, even though virtually. And it's been such a long time. Yeah, it has been two years. So now you are at the, um, at the brink of creating a new way of life, right? You worked in LinkedIn for eight years. Why did you decide to leave? Oh, well, first of all, I joined LinkedIn uh, for actually a reason. And that was on LinkedIn's vision of creating economic opportunity for the global workforce. And that was the time when I had a certain personal vision of helping people uh, progress in their lives. So my vision at that time and LinkedIn's vision, uh, I thought was pretty much uh, aligned. And that's why I thought, no, this is a great company to be. I've heard so much about LinkedIn. Um, Let me just give it a try. And since then, it's been eight years since I was uh, with the company. And because of um, my personal vision at that time, um, even though my day's job is really to um, help my teams bring business to LinkedIn in the Asia region, uh, I also take a bit, of, a, a bit of a voluntary and pro bono work. And somebody may call it a side hustle. And that is um, volunteering in the professional bodies, like for instance, the HR associations, the director's association. I also took up a t- coaching program and did a, quite a bit of coaching for my colleagues as well as externally. I've also uh, participated in organizing workshops and uh, doing speaking engagements in some forums. Now, I, I do this because I enjoy it and it's kind of aligned with what I want to do and also aligned with Basin's vision. But uh, at a certain point in time, it was probably about um, maybe one and a half years ago that um, I thought, you know, doing the pro bono work gives me a lot of energy. And at some point in time, I, th- I thought if I want to spend more time doing such work that gives me more energy, I need to stop doing certain things, right? We always talk about starting and stopping. Um, and it, I guess it was one year ago that I made a decision to say that, you know, I have to stop doing my day's job so that I can dedicate more time, you know, on the, at that time, the pro bono work and uh, which is aligned with the, my vision of wanting to impact people's lives in a more personal and in a more direct level. And that was why I decided to inform my boss uh, that was about a year before I quit and so that we can give sufficient time for the transition. Wow, so it was one year. Indeed. Yeah, it was a long time. And uh, one year was just over uh, at the end of March. So uh, I'm right now two weeks into my, um, my new vision. Wow. Yeah, well, uh, one year. So it takes that much for somebody to um, make a plan and exit. That That's a good time frame. So, so when we think about your considerations, um, financial, personal, uh, professional, 
what were they? So what were your considerations before you, you left LinkedIn? You said you, you spent one year working on, obviously, financial, personal and professional considerations. What were they? All right. Yeah. The one, the one year that I gave my um, manager was because there's a need to make sure that there's sufficient planning for my exit. Because uh, for my role, I do handle uh, quite a, a huge amount of business across many countries. So I thought it was necessary for us to uh, prepare the, the business and the organization for the transition. So uh, and it, it turned out pretty well uh, for, for LinkedIn as well as for myself and my team. Um, but because I have a, a long runway, it wasn't planned. But because of this long runway, I was able to uh, think about a couple of things. And like you say, you know, the, uh, on the personal side, I was actually pretty clear that um, this is what I really want to do. And it's something which uh, I can do so in a more direct way, given more time, and um, really scale some of the efforts that I've been starting on. And on the professional side, I actually realized I was able to leverage my learnings in, uh, the, in my past life as well as my last eight years with LinkedIn to really think, help people think about um, how they can think about their career, navigate it in the midst of an uncertain economic and technological environment, and build ever, an evergreen path towards career success regardless of what happens externally. So I thought, you know, it's pretty much aligned with what I've been doing and what I want to do. And at the same time, you know, some people have asked me, you know, you are a um, third level manager, uh, managing more than 100 over people, right? Why would you like to give it up? So I know it's like, I'm sure any, you must have been through it yourself because uh, you took a path, which actually I took reference from and it inspired me to take on this role, uh, this, this new uh, engagement. But, you know, once you have been there, done that, right, you realize that, you know, the span of control, the number of people you manage, the scope of your work matters less than the impact you want to make. So professionally, I was quite aligned as well. I was okay to be a uh, individual contributor or solopreneur. Uh, or, or portfolio, or life is, which whatever way you call it, uh, and it's okay with me. So I, I, there was there wasn't any disconnect on the professional fronts. Now on the financial fronts, there was uh, uh, indeed uh, some consideration, right? Because uh, I still need to make sure that uh, I earn a living. Uh, at the same time, uh, I have some savings, so that I believe I can actually take uh, a bit of risk over the next couple of years do things that I wanted to do, but never have uh, the necessary time to be engaged in. And um, it, it would be an interesting journey. Financially, I'm okay. So even if, let's say, I earn much less than what I used to be earning, it's still okay. And therefore, I decided to take it on. Great. Um, so so you said that um, you, you're earning much less than what you earned before. So that's what people find difficult because they just want nothing to change in their life. Right? They want to change the career, but if possible, nothing else to change in their life. <laughs> so how do you get to the point when you accept that, yeah, everything will change, even my financial situation, but I am okay with that. So how do you reach this point? Well, uh, you know, you're right. I think some people just didn't feel like they can make it. But um, personally, what I've been through myself and I've been coaching others as well is really to look at, first of all, the life, lifestyle preference, right? Is um, a, a Ferrari a basic need for you? Or yeah. Are you okay with taking on spot, for instance, right? Um, what, what's, uh, you know, what, what, what are the number of holidays you want to have? What sort of uh, lifestyle you prefer versus what sort of savings that you have? Right, that can last you for a period of time, and also um, we have some having some expectation that even though you may be earning less or you expect to earn less in future, um, there will be some income that can keep you going. And how 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 much is enough? And you know, it can be a very simple thing. You just take a, a spreadsheet and then just put down expense 
over the next X number of years and uh, income over the next number of years. Or you can go through a very detailed financial planning with, with a financial planner. But, uh, you know, once you have established that, you can, you, you, you can have confidence to say that, okay, I'm taking it full-time or I can do it part-time or maybe I stop doing what I dream of doing and uh, continue with my current role. But uh, I think it's good to go through this exercise so that uh, you know people can actually have the right insights on their life to pursue things that they really want to do. Great. So what was your departure journey like? How do you leave a company on a good note? Right. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Annie. And I th- during the, the, the one year of my transition, there are, are two key objectives I have achieved, uh, I, I, I have set up uh, with my manager. Uh, the first one is to ensure that uh, the business is at a level which is sustainable on a platform that uh, people, a new person, can take it on and run with it. Right. Uh, the second one is to elevate my next level of managers to take on more responsibilities so that uh, even after my departure, the business can scale. So, and I actually by and large divided it into two parts, six months each, if you would, actually. Our first one is really, and it, it coincides with uh, the first half of the financial year and the second half of the financial year. On the first half, you know, I actually led the business with more efforts and a lot more energy than before, right? Just to make sure that uh, the business goes further up than what it, it would have been. And then the second part is when I actually took a step back to enable my leaders, my second line leaders, to take on more responsibility that I used to take. And instead of playing the leadership role, I would actually play the supporting role to enable them to ease into the, the new responsibilities, added responsibilities, and be able to do well themselves. And it was, to me, it was a fantastic journey because I was able to exercise different types of uh, leadership behavior on the two halves. And of course, at the end of it, um, in the last uh, couple of months, uh, there was a lot of uh, very good farewell parties. I've been through, I tell you, I've, uh, at least 10 of them of, of, with uh, my colleagues from different parts of Asia. So uh, it was a very surreal moment. And in fact, I never really felt so close to my team members as I did uh, during that, those are the farewell days where you know we talk about uh, how pe- people have impacted their, their lives and how people have impacted my lives and and also people shared about how you know we have been working well together it was something which really becomes a very good memory for me uh, for a long long time to come well weren't you a bit sad to leave all this behind yeah indeed um there was a, a bit of a remiss um from my side as well as uh, my colleagues as well but at the end of the day we realized that you know we are actually doing really fulfilling our um, passion and um, vision of ourselves as well as to make some impact on society and as you know um you, you don't have to say goodbye forever right people will meet in a different capacity and i built a very good relationship with my team members so you know we can always catch up anytime you want but doing my travel, um, so it's never goodbye. It's always uh, see you soon. So in a sense, it it, it kind of like helps us uh, get through the kind of uh, challenges of you know leaving the business. I see. Um. So. So we said that um, you worked on making sure that the business you're leaving is in good shape, so somebody can take over and run with it. But what about preparing for for the next chapter? Did you have time to prepare while you were still working or this happened after you left? Uh, Yes, indeed. I had some time, given the long runway that I had, I had some time to prepare for my next chapter. And in fact, I call it uh, next play, my next play. (laughs) Right. And interestingly, next play is a term that is frequently used in LinkedIn to celebrate uh, individuals who have either gotten promoted or take on, taken on a new role in the current or, or different business. Uh, I thought it was very interesting because, you know, it makes um, the next chapter something that's more fun because play is fun. 
at the same time, something that's a bit more unstructured because, you know, a lot of play is unstructured, right? So it clearly reflects the, um, you know, what we're seeing in today's world. And therefore, you know, I, I took some time to plan about my next play as well as using next play as a framework to help people navigate their career. And so along the way, uh, I have a kind of like consolidated what I want to do, you know, even with the vision or uh, with the purpose of helping people and teams uh, achieve positive transformation with joy, I consolidated really into uh, what are the key things I can do to enable this purpose to come to life, right? And really, it boils down to helping people navigate their career, be successful regardless of external situation, and have fun while doing that, right? And, um, I also uh, decided to take on a couple of things. For instance, um, I plan to write a book about next play. Um, I'll, I've also signed up uh, for a INSEAD Executive Master of Change program. I'm going back to school again. And oh, um, okay. yeah, so it's something that I'm looking forward to. I'm starting my program in May. So looking forward to that. And um, thirdly, really, uh, I've also done some work on uh, coaching and speaking on next play so that uh, to really get people to be excited about it and help people along the way, at the same time, get some inputs into uh, how people are taking this framework. So it has been a great journey, you know, over the last uh, one year, preparing to leave the organization and preparing for my next play. I see. Well, if... if um... Um, if we go a bit deeper into into your prep preparation for next play, can you can you give a step by step guide for somebody who is watching or listening and they know okay if I want to leave my job and start my own venture, what are the steps I have to do? Oh, okay, right. So uh, if I were to use the um, the next play framework. And uh, I, I can actually share some thoughts I, I have. And obviously, in different people would have different ways of going about doing it, right? So, um, you know, the, I used it as an acronym. Uh, so NEXT, N-E-X-T, uh, it stands for new, and experience, and transformation. Okay. Right. And this uh, helps to set the context, right? To help people prepare their mind. So, for instance, uh, if I were in a position where, okay, I think that uh, I want to do something that's, that I find meaning in, right, that I'm engaged in and passionate about. So, first of all, I need to establish what's the new me, right? And before that, obviously, you need to look at what is the current me, right? What are the uh, aspirations I have, the uh, talents that I'm having up to now, the likes and dislikes, Right, and my value system, and how would it be different from the new me, right? Or how I can align this with the new me. And I, I can think about the experience that I want to get along the way, as well as the transformation that I need to undertake to get to the new me, right? So this sets uh, the context, right? Yeah. And once you do that, then um, you can then go to the play, right? And play, to me, uh, establishes the methodology, for people to really think through. So P stands for plan, right? You need to plan. I, you know, to your question, ask me, what's the step-by-step -step guide, right? So yeah. what's the, the, few, the few things you need to do in order to take on the new experience and transformation, the plan, right? Yeah. And then the L stands for learn, right? Then what you need to learn, obviously there's, there'll be something new, right? Because you want to find, make it fun and make it engaging. If there'll be something new. So what are the new learnings that you want to have? And then the A stands for taking action. So I've seen a lot of people, they have great ideas, they plan, they may even learn something, um, but they don't take action. Now, taking action really talks about um, the experimentation that you want to have. So for instance, if let's say some, you are holding on to uh, an existing full-time role, you can take some action on in terms of volunteering in a project group, volunteering in an external organization, uh, volunteering in, in doing something that you're passionate about, right? And such 
experiment provides you with, with an opportunity to try out what your next engagement group can be, but without the necessary obligation for you to do it full time. Right. And um, and then once you do this, the the plan, learn, and action, you can iterate again and go back to planning. And along the way, you get you know more about yourself, you know more about the environment, and then you take some more action, and then you with this iteration, you become closer and closer to what you really can do, want to do, where people want you to do for, for them. And then at the end of the day, you know, what do you get? Yay, the why. And that stands for joy, right? Yeah. So, so kind of like, I'll, I'll say that, you know, if you think about this, just use a framework and think about it. Hopefully, it can get uh, you somewhere, right, to do things that you love to do. Great. No, that's that's a great approach. So next play. Good. Well, I guess that as every change and transformation, it came with its um, fair share of doubts and fears. Can you share some of these doubts and fears and how uh, did you deal with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, Eddie. You know, uh, when I was... Um, planning for this transition uh, on a personal level, I realized uh, that I would have to do a lot of things for the very first time. So for instance, right, I've never written a book before, right? And uh, now I need to write a book. Um, I haven't been going back to formal education for many, many years. And now I'm taking on a, a two-year executive master program and, um, you know, I have been doing uh, coaching, speaking, training, um, very much on a pro bono basis. But now I need to think about, you know, charging for some of the things that uh, I'm doing. So all these are very, very new. And I have to learn, you know, as it, it's kind of like uh, without thinking about it, 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 I actually followed my methodology. You know, I, I plan to do that, but then I need to learn how to do it, right? So I have to yeah. learn the publishing ecosystem, meet up with publishers to see how I can, uh, you know, they can support me in writing the book, what the process is, how long does it take, how long must each chapter be, and so on. And I've got to learn about, uh, you know, how the Executive Master of Change program can support the writing of my book, what's the thesis like. i got to learn about, uh, you know, how to develop my first uh, offering <laughs> for coaching and, uh, and training, right? So uh, these are all very interesting. In fact, I, I have to learn how to set up my first company. I've never set up my first company, my, my company before, you know, coming out with a company bank book and uh, so on. So these are some of the things that I have to do. And along the way, there were always doubts. It's on, first of all, am I setting myself up for failure? <laughs> well, you know, um, have I spread myself too thin? I try to do so many things. Or uh, one of the things that, you know, I have not done that should be done, uh, should be done, right? Because this, these are all the things I'm, I've been doing for the first time. Yeah. So uh, quite a bit of doubts, but I think the, the key driver uh, at that time was really the, the kind of newness that was very encouraging. And, you know, it helps you become more creative in finding solutions. And that really got me excited. Uh, and that also got me to wake up every day feeling that, yeah, I want to do something that's new, something that is maybe extra. I need to take a longer time, but it's okay. I love this and I'm going to go go for it anyway. And it gives him the kind of excitement to try new things. So in a sense, uh, he has been a fantastic journey. Not planned, but uh, going through it, it was wonderful for me. Um. Okay, so I ask you another question, which is, um, you know, till now, you were out there as the head of LinkedIn for Asia, right? And you have your card and it's written and you have this big name, amazing name behind you. And now you go out and there is no name. It's only you, right? And it's a something, a new name, next play, who nobody knows about. So how did you come in terms, come to terms with that? Because it is a big change, right? Yeah. Eddie, that is the billion-dollar question. 
<laughs> Many of people have been asking me about this, right? So, you know, I I thought back and you know I was thinking about、um, you know as we were working, right? And you know you've run, you've been the COO of City City Corp before, right? It was a big title, the big name as well. So then the question is, how do we identify ourselves? Do we identify ourselves as the title we are holding? With the company we're working for, or do we identify ourselves in some other areas, right? And secondly, how do we define our self worth? Is it fully about you know the work that we do, or is there something else? So, having thought through this, you know, I I have actively pursued identity outside of title, outside of um. The company, even though you know LinkedIn is、uh, is、uh, like you say a good brand and they've been doing great things,、um, but I tried to actually do some do do identify myself as a coach to someone, a、um, speaker on a certain topic, right, and、um, maybe a, a a dad to my son, and so forth. So I begin to have different identities, and I establish. My self worth based on some of those things that I was engaging in, which I was passionate about in supporting, and over time I realized that you know, it 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 is not it doesn't really matter whether you are a, a head of a big company or whether you are an individual contributor in a new organization, which is a one man shop that you're running. Right now, I must I must also say that.、Um, I've also been fortunate enough to establish a network, right, on、uh, both on LinkedIn as well as uh, uh, offline, right. And in fact, I, I think I got to know you during COVID when we actually were connected on LinkedIn, and then we had a couple of conversations, even though we are different parts of the world, right. Exactly. And this network actually does help, right? It does help. Like for instance, I wouldn't have been in your、uh, podcast if not for the connection that we had three years ago. So with、yeah. this network. You know, we are able to establish, re-establish links, and continue pursuing what we really love and enjoy, and I think that really got us、uh, going in, you know, with、um, more certainty, as well as a progress in the right direction faster. Great.、Um, the way you explain it, it sounds, it sounds、um, like it's easy to do, <laughs> but, but I'm sure it's not,、uh, because. While you can start identifying with these other people, you know,、um, the coach, the career strategist, the change advisor. I'm talking about myself, but it takes time to actually say, "Yeah, I'm okay with that." You know, I'm not going to feel that I'm less of. I'm not going to feel that I'm not good enough, etc. Because this was some of my. My fears and my、mm, transition process that I was just、uh, thinking: How am I going to accept myself in that new situation? And it took a lot of time. It took a lot of time、um, to to kind of say, "Yeah, it doesn't matter whether I'm、uh, with a big title or not." Basically, life is much more than that. But it takes time to come to that conclusion. Do you agree with that? Oh, totally, totally. Yes. Um. In fact, um. You know what I try to do with my framework on next play is also to help people, right? To really go through the journey. Hopefully, before, you know, the title is taken away from that. Yeah. To really think and reestablish the self worth outside of that particular title with the particular company, right? And I must say, uh, actually, I I, I was fortunate enough. To have、uh, both a a mentor as well as、uh, a personal observation on a specific area related to what we talk about. So, how do you let go of the title? You know, especially for people who have been very successful having、uh, big titles. So,、uh, the mentor was actually one of my ex、uh, manager, and he told me that、uh, you know, the title we have is like a crown that's given by the company. When we leave the company, the crown will be taken away from us, 
and we'll be totally exposed. So be ready for that. Right. And, uh, the personal experience I, I have is really watching a, a one of the, the a president of one of the biggest multilateral agency in the world. I, I wouldn't know which one. Um, I, I watched how the transition happened on two occasions within two months. Right. On the first occasion, he was the guest of honor in a global conference and he was doing the keynote. And there was a time when he was escorted up on stage, right? When he was uh, having a bit of cough during the midst of his presentation, somebody would bring up the water for him to drink. Two months later, I saw him uh, in the airport in Singapore, the Changi airport, holding on to three luggages and that was the time when uh, he has left the organization. So he was at the airport, holding on to three luggages, looking at which is the next connecting flight that he must be taking or must have missed. <laughs> so, you know, these two are still very real to me. These two, these two images are still very real to me. And that was at that time, I realized that, you know, do not hold on to the title that you're given because once it's gone, you got to know how to survive. So actually I had this uh, interesting experience before <laughs> my one year ago. And I, I, I kind of can identify with and it makes it easier for me. I, I agree that it's not easy for many, many people. And uh, I'm trying to help such people to get through this so that uh, it makes the next play easier. I see. Um, my approach to that was um, I was having, I was thinking, so what, what is the worst that can happen? What is the worst? Is is my life going to be um, that much different? No. Um, would I have the same people that, I mean, my my relationship with my network, is it going to stay the same? Or maybe not exactly the same, but I'm going to lose some people, but I'm going to earn new connections. You know, I'll find new connections. So, yeah, it will be balanced. Um, in terms of personal, per, uh, in terms of my private life, what is going to change actually is going to improve because I'm going to see my family and be able to spend more time with my mother, my sister, my friends, etc. So when you think about it, what's the worst that can happen? You just come to the conclusion that it's always give and take. And uh, sometimes the next step is, is far better than, than what you have at the moment. Even though you think it's a big, big risk. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yes, I, I love it. Uh, I did, you know, think about the worst that's going to happen. And then you realize that in reality, what's going to happen is far better than the worst. Right? So you can live with the worst, the rest are all gravy for you. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> I love this. Yeah, this is a definitely a good way to look into this. Uh, I'll definitely include in some of the, uh, the, the, the coaching sessions that I have. Oh, uh, with, with my companies. Yeah, please don't charge me royalty for that. <laughs> well, I'll think about it. Okay. Um, so, so in terms of um, other difficulties, anything else that you want to share? Anything else that we haven't talked about? Um, well, I, I think the key, the key thing is really to have this kind of commitment as well as confidence, right? That, uh, you know, what you're doing is something that is um, purposeful and also something which you have the skills for that can help you build the, 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 the steps towards achieving what you want to achieve, right? Uh, if, I call this you know, taking intelligence risk, right? First of all, we need to acknowledge that as you said, there will be risk involved, right? What you expect will happen may not, may not happen. Yeah. Right? Um, at the same time, there may be other things uh, that will put you into a bit of an issue, a challenge, which you never thought before. Exactly. Right? So, yeah, these are the risks. So, the idea is to expect that, you know, risk is normal. Uh, failure can also happen. And then from there, like, like you say, 
ask yourself then if the risks appear and um, the failures happen, what's the worst case situation? Right? Now, a lot of times the worst case situation, uh, or, or a lot of times what happens is really much better than the worst case situation. But if you can accept the worst case situation, the rest are okay, right? Yeah. Now, the important thing is that um, despite all this, we must take action. Because I've seen a lot of people, they are so conservative that uh, even though they've covered most of the risk and expected most of the unexpected, uh, they still do not take action. And that's something that is um, very, very depressing because uh, eventually at the end of their career, they realize that you know they, they have been feeling stuck for many, many decades and they felt that they couldn't get out of it. Right. So, so that's, that's why what I want to do is to use the idea of a uh, next play to ensure that people not just plan or learn, but also to take action. Simple actions, experiments, right? And they can know themselves better. They can know the environment better. And then they can pivot along the way, which is what in the current environment we need to do, you know, with agility, with adaptability. Because once we are able to have such ability and with the right mindset, then we can be very confident that regardless of external situation, we would have an ever evergreen path to a career success. Yeah. You know, the, the, it's very natural human reaction to hesitate. I think that's, that's something that the brain does anyway, because it's connected with our survival instinct, right? And especially when you do something different. But, but the thing is that if we, if we don't, as you said, take, take action, we'll be in that hesitant situation for a long time. And the more we are in that situation, the more it's difficult for us to, to find the solution. Because then the brain hijacks the whole of it and, uh, and starts throwing only negative, negative um, uh, signs and negative thoughts because you just have to control it. You have to control it more than anything. And I'm so, so I'm, our brain is basically our biggest impediment <laughs> when, when it comes to change, right? Um, you would think it would be different, but I guess this is the, as I said, survival uh, instinct. It stops us doing anything different. Yes, indeed, indeed. And on the other hand, if you take action, you develop a certain amount of um, hormone that actually supports the brain into being more creative, right? And also, also happier. So in a sense, uh, taking action can also drive positive change to the brain such that uh, you're able to be to feel more fulfilled and you're able to take the next step and the next step and the next step much better. Yeah. Right? Compared to let's say you don't take action, all the negative elements will come into the brain that cause you to feel stuck all the time. Exactly. No, no, that's that's absolutely true. And um even even last night I was thinking about a problem and I was I was thinking of how I'm going to solve this, what I'm going to do. And this morning I, I said, okay, I don't know the answer. I'm going to ask two people to help me. And only that thought that I'm going to now ask these two people. And I felt instantly better <laughs> because no matter what they tell me, it's a step forward. They can tell me something. It might not be helpful, but it but can give me another idea. So taking action is, is amazing. So looking back, um, what would be key advice you gi you will give to somebody who is in the same situation like you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I think um, many, peop many, many people, you know, at a certain point of their career, you feel that there's a, a bit of um, dissociation between what are they doing now and what they want to do, right? And I know from my coaching experience that a lot of people can't figure out what it is, they just feel uncomfortable, you know, they, they feel like they're not happy, but they can't figure out what it is, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll suggest that uh, people, first of all, think about, you know, what is meaning to them in both the, the life as well as the career? What makes them, what gives them uh, joy, right? 
in terms of the tasks that they do, the projects they undertake, or the job that they take on. And in fact, uh, you can just look back and then look at, you know, which point in their career they find particularly uh, more joyful and which part they find that, you know, kind of like it was a bit dull and monotonous. And then they can actually get some kind of baseline. And the second thing is to look at, uh, well, you know, if they have a life purpose, uh, go for it. If not, then, you know, what is the aspiration? What do you want to become in three years' time? What do you see their life, uh, you know, in three years' time? It can be, you know, something related to themselves, the professional life, or the families, right? But have a certain idea of what they want to do in X number of years, then that establishes some kind of aspiration. And then look back, uh, think about what sort of strength they have. Some people will go through a, you know, a uh, Clifton Strength test to understand themselves better, or the many tests along the way that can help them understand themselves. Uh, also, talk, look, a bit, look at what sort of values and systems as well as the lights they have. And, and then that forms a foundation, right? For them to rethink really about what they want to do if they feel stuck, right? And the idea is that to, to know that uh, feeling stuck is just temporary. That once they have, you know, the self-awareness, you know, what I was talking about just now was really about self-awareness. And once they have the awareness of the environment, for instance, uh, what roles are available in which industries, which organizations, and you can have you know, lots of information online right now to, uh, to, to, to have a better understanding. And um, with self-awareness, environmental awareness, then you can think about what's the skills they want to, to build to actually take on the next role and then take the necessary experiments to, to try it out a bit on a you know, part-time basis to feel how is, is it like. And over time, you know, when they iterate this process, they'll be able to understand themselves better, the environment better, they know what's available, and they may even land on something along the way that uh, you know, they, they are totally engaged in. So it's good to uh, really suss out and maybe take a side hustle I've done that, uh, as I shared with you, and that got me going. And um, I can assure you, you'll be better off uh, once this happens. Great. That's, um, that was such a great um, ending for our podcast. Thank you so much for all the information and all the um, guidance uh, you gave. This is very fresh for you. You, you shared that uh, it was only three weeks since you left uh, such a company like uh, LinkedIn. So thank you so much. And I want to use this opportunity to thank you for um, being such a great uh, partner and um, and connection and relationship. And I wish you all the best, all the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. The pleasure is mine. And i um, so great to be part of your podcast and look forward to uh, hearing more and more podcasts coming from you. Thank right. you.